Welcome everyone, Marcelo is my name. I'm the Niche Fragrance Collector and it feels wonderful to be back behind this desk. Actually, I, I, it's funny how I didn't think I would miss this, but I, yeah, I actually miss being here and uh, being in this sort of setup and being able to talk to you about some amazing brands. Uh, for those who have been following my channel, you know that I've been traveling quite a bit. Uh, we did a, an awesome stint in Italy, then Malaysia, and then came back. I was traveling around Australia. It was pretty intense and it was exciting. I'm not complaining about any of it. I'm, I'm grateful and thankful that I had an opportunity to do all of that. But it did mean that it made it hard to be in this right here and being able to uh, create these particular episodes for you guys. I want to talk about Paris Monte Carlo. It's a brand that I've uh, known for a little while now. My good friend Kevin from Oligarch Store here in Melbourne introduced me to this brand a little while back. First one that I actually got in the series was Santal du de Pacific. Fell in love with this and then started to explore the brand even deeper. I had an opportunity to go to Italy and actually filmed in the flagship store, which is in Lago di Garda, alongside both Carlos and Alessandra. Uh, these individuals, actually, did, let me just say, that was, you know, it's like bucket list things that you wanna do in your life. That was one of them. I mean, everything about it was, was almost, uh, it, was, it was surreal. I mean, for those who know, Lago di Garda, it's like Lake Como, picturesque, just something out of a postcard. And then the store, if you ever get a chance to go into that part of the world, go to the Paris store, you, everything is there, all the, the full collection is there, just the, the whole place is spectacular. Anyway, I had a chance to film there with Carlos, with Alessandra, and had a chance to get a much deeper understanding about the brand. Now, so today what I wanna do is, I'm gonna break up, the, they have different collections. So they've got the black, they've got the gold, and they've got the Italian. This one here is the black, these are the ones that are in my uh, collection currently. Uh, I hesitated because I'm like, yeah, for now, <laughs> these are in my collection for now, anyway. Um, and what I wanna do is I'm gonna slow it down. So I'm not gonna talk about all three today. I'm only gonna talk about the patchouli nosy bee. But first, who is Jean-Luc Paris? Now, Jean-Luc is the creative director. He's the brainchild. I mean, it's named after him. The brand is called Paris Monte Carlo. So Jean-Luc is a second generation perfumer. He actually is the nose for a number of the fragrances within the collection. He is the creative director for all of them. All right, so everything that you see within the Paris Monte Carlo lineup has had, I guess, his blessing. Now, one thing that you'll notice straight away, especially from the black collection, actually, especially from all of them, all of them have one similarity, and that is that the name of the fragrance is actually the core ingredient of that perfume. The one that I'm gonna focus on today is Patchouli Nosy Bee. So the focus is the note. And Jean-Luc mentioned that it's about, when he, when he first created the company or first created the, the, the brand, that it's about respecting the fragrance note. It's about respecting that particular ingredient and not trying to crowd it with too many other things that all of a sudden detract from what that note is all about. In this case here, as I mentioned, the focus will be patchouli nosy bee. When I first came across it, I actually thought nosy bee was just a cool marketing name. What threw me off a little bit was that there's ylang ylang nosy bee. And I'm like, well, the marketing team got a bit lazy <laughs> or couldn't be bothered. And uh, just, you know, let's call this one patchouli nosy bee and that one ylang ylang nosy bee. And what the heck, let's call them all nosy bee. The reason why it's called nosy bee, I'll tell you shortly. First. Patchouli is one of those notes that you either love or you hate. And I'm gonna use, I know hate is such a, such a, and it's, it's an ugly word, such a strong word, but that's what I feel, or that's what I've discovered. That some people, they just, they really get blocked by patchouli. When the moment that they know patchouli is in the fragrance, they're like, mm, not for me, or they'll go, mm, hang on a second, and this is my wife, by the way, hang on a second. Is there patchouli in this? And it's not really a question, it's almost an accusation. How dare you give me a fragrance that has patchouli in it? So patchouli is quite polarizing. For me, I love, I love patchouli. I've said this before, uh, those who have followed some of the other uh, episodes that I've created, I enjoy the patchouli note. What I like about it is the very point that my wife hates about it, is its mustiness. So the characteristic of patchouli is 
that it's slightly spicy. It has an earthy tone to it. There's a woody component to it also. So it has all these different facets and obviously it, depending on how the perfumer is using it, accentuates these different elements to it. It's the musty component. And mind you, I like all of those. So, you know, uh, I like earthy, I like spicy, I like musty. Actually, it's the musty that really draws me in. And that's the very part that most people find it a little bit repellent. And they're like, ooh, it's a bit, I don't know, there's a bit of a mildew sort of smell to it. And that's also part of, believe it or not, that is part of its uh, scent profile, like a mildew cork, cork-like smell to it. I always wonder, where do things commence? I always think to myself, who was the first guy that decided to grab a potato, cut it, throw it into a fry, or throw it into some hot oil and create you know, a masterpiece essentially? So who was the first person that came across patchouli and thought, because it's a, it's a fairly large leaf. And the other, the other thing too is that the leaf itself does not have a smell. You have to wait for it to dry and, if you, have to, and you have to dry it properly because if it creates, if it has any form of um, uh, moisture in that leaf, it doesn't create the right robust scent. So who was the guy that came up with this? I'll tell you. So back in the Middle Ages, they found that, and this is the Silk Road, as they were importing a lot of uh, ingredients from the Asian continent across to Europe, they were uh, moving a lot of um, silks, so a lot of, a lot of uh, textiles. And they found that by wrapping up the, the textiles inside the patchouli leaf, it actually functioned as a moth repellent. It's a, it, 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 another part to patchouli, it does have a camphorous side to it. There's a camphorous note in there also. And so they would wrap up these silks in the, the patchouli leaf and send them over to Europe. And they, would, yeah, they wouldn't be eaten by the moths, essentially. Now, what happened was these textiles, they got a little bit of that patchouli note. And that's what commenced the, I guess, the exploration as to there's something in this plant that creates a scent. Let's see if we can use it for fragrance. The first part of that fragrance was in Victorian England when they were using it as pot puree. Uh, it was very fashionable to have, I mean, still fashionable today, to have pot puree, but it was like the height of fashion at that stage during Victorian England to have put a pot puree in your home and patchouli was a key ingredient in that. It then wasn't long before perfumers realized uh, that they could actually extract oil out of this and create and use it in perfumes. However, you may hear that patchouli has a bad reputation. This is stemmed from around the 1850s. There was a, a group of women called Demi Monde and essentially they were prostitutes, so they, but they were well-to-do prostitutes in that they were being kept by uh, wealthy Parisians. So these Demi Monde women enjoyed, enjoyed the good life. One of the things of the good life is perfume. Supposedly they, they were very liberal with the perfume, uh, in particular the patchouli note. A terminology came out which was secucot, and it ba basically it means, I believe that the French people who still use it, French people out there, let me know if that's the case. Uh, my understanding is that secucot is, it smells cheap. But what they were really saying to these demi monde women, these prostitutes, you're cheap. <laughs> my husband should be home helping me with the children and he's, you know, spending time with you. Mm, secucot. So, Patchouli got a really bad rap around that stage. The second bad rap I guess it got was during the hippie area, during the 60s, free love again, and they were using patchouli as their signature, their, I guess their smell of revolution essentially. Um, so you find that, I mean, for me that just says one thing, patchouli has a sexual energy to it. There's something in that patchouli, you know, it could be the earthiness, it could be the, there's a woody tone to it, it could be that mustiness. I don't know, the, the may, but, but something smells of sex and patchouli is a part of that. Patchouli is in that, in that mix. Who made patchouli respectable? So if I sort of reel back a little bit in time, Francois Coty, who was a very famous uh, perfumer, 1917, he created what is now known as Shipra, as the, uh, the, the fragrance family essentially. But he created uh, Chypre de Coty. And Chipper de Coty essentially had patchouli in the base. He actually used it to accentuate the, that, that particular fragrance. It became a hit. That Chipper de Coty became a, a hit. The whole Chipper as a family you know, exploded. It's now a thing. So we have, a, we have Chipper fragrances. It's interesting though too that Chipper as a designation, what does it mean? It's in reference to the island of Cyprus. Who was born in Cyprus? 
Venus, who is Venus? She's the goddess of love and beauty. So again, I go back, there is a sexual energy, in my opinion, with patchouli. Patchouli has something in it, inbuilt, that creates something there. One last thing, where is patchouli? So the actual essential oil, where is it sourced from? Primarily, it's actually, it's grown in Indonesia and Malaysia, the two major, um, I guess, providers in the world. And it's interesting, like 90%. In other words, all your, your uh, patchouli fragrances uh, the oil comes from those particular countries, except this one here, and this is why I want to make a, This is why I want to make that distinction. So Nosy Bee is actually an island. I did not know this. Off the coast of Madagascar, there is an island called Nosy Bee. In fact, the island is known for Ilanilang. It's actually called the Scented Island. Supposedly, when Jean Luca went to the island. He said that all he could smell was Ilangilang in the air. The growers of Ilangilang did an experiment and planted the patchouli in the, I guess, the shade of the Ilangilang tree. Patchouli grows best in shade, it likes shaded areas. And the patchouli from Nosy Bee developed a nuance that drew Jean Luc's attention. And I want to talk about that. On the opening, you're getting a burst of lemon, followed by in the heart, pink pepper. Finally, in the base, patchouli from Nosy Bee, vanilla absolute, musk, cedarwood, amber, and sandalwood. Let's smell it. L let me say this quickly. My wife loves this perfume, okay? So that automatically, if you're unsure about patchouli, if you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if this is for me, my wife loves this perfume. It should have approved by Marcelo's wife on the back, okay? So that gives you an idea that this is a patchouli that you're not familiar with. This is a patchouli, uh, the, whatever references you may have had on patchouli, push them aside for the time being, go out, look for patchouli nosy bee, and, and, dis, and, see, and see how it works for you. If you do love the patchouli note, if you do love the, the various components of it, then I'm going to say that you will, you will just adore this, this particular fragrance. Now it's interesting, it, it says, so the opening note is lemon, but I'm not getting, so there's no citrus burst. So there's nothing, there's nothing that comes through that citrus-like. I think it goes back to the very core of what Jean-Luc's mission is, and that is respect the note. And so rather than crowd it with something else or confuse the, the perfume lover with other components to this, what you're getting is the different almost facets of patchouli. For me, the moment it opens, it's already ambery and warm. There is a peppery, sort of spicy component to it. That mustiness that I spoke about earlier, or that earthiness, that, that moisture, I don't get that until deeper into the dry down. I'm sure the lemon is doing its thing, but it's only supporting the main act, which is patchouli. I get a comfortable six to seven hours out of this fragrance. I find that the sillage is moderate. I find that the projection on this is actually pretty good. It pushes out from, my, from me quite well. It definitely, it does never, I never feel that it falls into a body scent. It actually extends itself quite nicely. The one thing that I love about this, and this is the part that Jan Luca fell in love. Now, go look at Fragrantica. Have a look at the notes that are listed there, and you'll see that it says cacao. There is no cacao in here. The patchouli from Nosy Bee has this cacao, like a bitter chocolate component to it. This is what John Luca actually picked up. So when he smelt the patchouli from Nosy Bee, he detected that chocolate, that cacao. And that's the part that I think is totally awesome. So here is a patchouli fragrance that has the, the components that you're familiar with, but then it comes in with something completely new, some, something completely different. On the dry down, it does go into that dry wood, musty component to it. So it does, so it, it's a patchouli fragrance. So it, it, it honors that, that particular note. I find that it works well in summer. Admittedly, the ambery tones and those, and those woods that are in the base, it does push itself to those cooler evenings. Uh, it's awesome as a going out fragrance, but I've worn it in summer. Um, I actually got this when I was in Italy in Milan. It was scorching hot. I was wearing patchouli nosy bee. 
And um, one thing about the Italians, and, and I love the Italians, they only, ha they only do one button up. They, <laughs> they walk around with one button on the shirt, uh, shirt is open. And so yeah, so here I was rocking open shirt, uh, patchouli nosy bee, nice, beautiful, warm, warm uh, weather, warm on my skin, and it smelled amazing. So yes, it works well in winter. Yes, it works well in summer. Comfortably unisex, male or female, without a problem. This is an elegant, refined, and I would say exotic fragrance. Something a little bit different. If you like patchouli, this is something that I would recommend that you go and check out. If you don't like patchouli, go and check it out. I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are on this particular fragrance. Hope you guys enjoyed that. It's great to be back, baby. It's great to be back behind the desk. I uh, look forward to your comments and I look forward to your comments on all things patchouli nosy bee. We'll see you guys on the next episode.